Good afternoon, everyone. David Wright here, and I'm your host of Disruptive Innovators, the Champions of Digital Business podcast. And this afternoon, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Mark Burkhead. Mark, how are you? Great, David. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Mark. Mark, so I, tell uh, tell our audience about your, your current role and, and where you are now. Sure. So I'm the Chief Data Analytics Officer for Chase, as well as our wealth management business, J.P. Morgan Wealth Management. And uh, there's three parts to our organization. We obviously have our data teams and our office of the Chief Data Officer. And so that basically really focuses on the governance of our data, ensuring that we're meeting the commitments to our customers around privacy and so forth. We also have our product teams that are really focus on ensuring we have the best platforms for our analytics teams to use. And so they really focus on things like our lakes, like our pipelines, our migration into the public cloud. And then we have our analytics teams and that's the biggest part of our organization. And those teams have a pretty broad analytic mandate. We have some teams that are focused on geospatial analytics and they ensure that we're using the best information we possibly can have to place our 5,000 branches and our ATMs and make sure that branch network is really optimized where our customers really need them. We have teams focused on marketing and ensuring that our targeting and our models and communication to our customers is as robust as it can possibly be. And that covers all of our channels, including our paid media and our media spots that we go with. Um, we also have teams focused on sales sciences. We have a very large branch network. We have a lot of bankers and advisors and other sales teams. And so we have a team that's really focused on ensuring they have the best information possible so we can possibly serve our customers as best as we can. And then lastly, we have teams that are focused on modeling and real-time analytics and really focused on how we keep pace with our customers and keep momentum going in our communication streams with customers. And so that's kind of our organization overall from a Chase perspective. I'm also the executive sponsor for all of our machine learning and data science internship programs or rotational programs globally, um, and uh, have a lot of focus on people and culture firm-wide. I love that. Um, yeah, I'm excited to get uh, a little deeper into your vision for the organization and some of those different groups. Um, but we'd like to start out uh, the episode with one piece of actionable advice that you'll look to give our listeners today. Sure. I would say for individuals thinking about a career in data analytics, or if you are thinking of leading a data analytics organization, you know, the thing we really are focused on is ensuring that the analytic vision, the analytic roadmap, the analytic strategy is completely tied to the business and to your customers or clients, and it's communicated in the right way. And that communication sometimes falls down a bit. And so ensuring that alignment is really important and ensuring that the business leaders can actually cite that roadmap and that plan is really important. I love that. Yeah, we're actually in the process of building out a data strategy module ourselves, and it's all about that, right? I mean, so often we'll find that organizations kind of just start trying to, uh, you know, start these data initiatives, but without really understanding the the business vision that's driving it or the challenges that they're looking to solve for, and you know, connecting those two is is crucial. So, um, yeah, that's and we great also advice. find that you know, with without that vision and without that direction, you have a lot of analytic teams that just kind of go their own way and they sometimes transact, and then actually not using the full power of the data and able to kind of make the big impact that is possible. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to be able to learn a lot from, um, you know, a, an organization as mature as, as yours. So um, I'll be looking forward to learning more. Um, but before we get into that, I want to get into a little bit about your your personal backstory. So where did you start out and how did you get to where you are now? Yeah, so I actually started my career, like so many others, uh, with an internship. And so in grad school, I interned at GE Capital. And at the time, there really wasn't data scientists and data analytics, but there were analytic functions that were embedded in things like risk and so forth. And so I did an internship one summer, fell in love with it, taught myself how to code, and then went back there. And so I began my career actually in risk management, doing modeling and so forth, leading risk management teams, and then moved over to decision sciences about 10 years ago. And so ever since then, I've been focused more on the growth side of the business, really connecting analytics and data to our customers and the business needs. 
Very cool. Um, and I, you know, I want to touch on some more philosophical things before we kind of get into the 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 technology piece. Um, what's what's one of the most important things that you've learned over the course of your life, and what was life like before learning it and after learning it? Yes, I think um, you know a lot of lessons that one kind of you know comes to be, but the thing that I'm you know thinking about more recently and, and now, particularly in this particular role, is just the real need to have a really solid mirror and a really solid set of truth tellers surrounding you as you kind of go through your career, especially as you become more senior in career, that becomes, you know, more difficult. I would say, you know, this organization is, is pretty large. It spans multiple geographies. We have all types of seniority levels here, but it actually doesn't matter where you are or how senior you are the biggest driller we tend to find is individuals where the perception of themselves or their skills varies greatly from the reality. And so I think making sure you have that good mirror, those set of colleagues or peers or friends that will tell you the way it is and reduce the variance between perception and reality is really, really important. And so we do stress that a lot here. Great advice, sage advice. Um, how about, um, you know, obviously, I've I've learned the most from my uh, failures, either projects, careers I've had in, in my past. What's one of the biggest failures that you've had, or maybe not the biggest, but um, a failure that you learned a lot from um, over the course of your career? Yes, I've had a few of those as well. Um, and so as one does, I would say just kind of in general, in terms of failures and really kind of all those hardships that go with it is, you know, they tend to stick in your mind longer than the successes. And I know we always celebrate the successes and think about how great it was, but as you kind of look back, it really are those harder moments that actually kind of drives lasting change and drives reflection and introspection and really, you know, thinking about how things could have been done differently. You know, and so, you know, what I tend to think about is across all those failures, there were a couple of commonalities and, and themes. And so it wasn't really the strategy or the idea, you know, those things were, were largely intact, um, but it was a lack of collaboration. It was a lack of buy-in and consensus. It was a lack of culture in some instances where you just couldn't actually execute and get that done. And so as I think about like my most challenging moments, that really was at the heart of it, those themes. You know, and so as I think about this organization and myself, you know, leading with humility is a really important lesson I learned from those failures, ensuring you know what you know and what you don't know, and being open to all that feedback, you know, managing with respect and fairness. Those are words that we use a lot in this organization and things that we really do focus on. And so, you know, I think for me, it really is that that saying, you know, culture each strategy for lunch and breakfast. Like we firmly believe in that and we've seen that happen countless times. And so that really is something that's important to us to build that, that type of uh, environment that's healthy, where people feel safe to kind of disagree, but also you drive really good conversations about outcomes. Love that. And I, I, wanna, I wanna dive into um, you know, your vision for, for your organization. Uh, before we dive into that, um, quick curveball, favorite book or, or blog that um, you're, you're into right now? This is like the worst question for me. Um, so I don't know if there's a favorite. Uh, I would say that I kind of jump around books a lot. I would say just in general, I, I tend to kind of read books to disconnect. And so sometimes it's history, sometimes it's fiction, sometimes it's historical fiction, um, but it's always kind of geared towards that. And so I don't know that I can tell you a favorite, but I can tell you like those are the genres that, that generally I use and I, I tend to use that to kind of disconnect it, so. I like that. I like that. All right. So then let's get into it. So um, you're chief data and analytics officer of an organization like Chase. I mean, super cool. What's your vision for, for the organization? Yeah. So our, our vision begins with the customers. And that really is the coolest thing about our job is we have so much information and data about our customers. And so it begins with them. And then it continues with the vision of Chase. And so at the end of the day, the analytic vision, the data vision, the product vision is all tied to those two things. Where is the customer going? And has that get translated into the overall strategy for the business? And so for us, 
you know, we want to be the bank for all. We want to be the bank that helps people make the most of their money so they can make the most of their lives. We want to be the bank that serves our communities well across our 48 state footprint. And we want to be the bank that eradicates banking deserts and brings more fairness. And so given all of those missions, our real focus is to A, protect our customers' privacy and their data, because it always begins with that respect of our customers. But then we responsibly use the data we have with machine learning, AI, with analytics, with modeling to actually, you know, improve those outcomes. And sometimes those outcomes come in the sense of nudges on our apps or snapshot, which is a feature we have. It also comes in terms of how we inter uh, direct um, interact with our business partners and everything else and how we, you know, really build solutions for our employees to use. And so across all those stripes really touches data and analytics. And what I would say is the nice thing about this particular firm is that analytics is not an afterthought. We are at the table really working to kind of craft those strategies. And so at the end of the day, if we can get more personal with our customers and make sure that the conversations we're having really are relevant to them and they get communicated in a way that is transparent to them and clear and easy to understand, that's a big focus of ours analytically. And if we can actually make our employees smarter and help them make better use of their time so they can actually help more customers with their vision, then that's even better. And so that's kind of the way we think about the vision for the organization. It is absolutely tied to the firm's vision. Very cool. What are what are some of the initiatives that you're you're most excited about? Yeah, so you know, there's a couple of things we're really, you know, focused on. And so one is really keeping pace with our customers. And so that requires us to retool so many of our platforms that have been working on a more delayed basis and move into streaming platforms and so forth. And that is where our destination at the public cloud comes into focus. That's where our use of AI comes into focus. All of that enablement of real-time conversations and everything else really comes into play. Um, and so that's kind of one thing that we're absolutely focused on. Um, you know, second, you know, we want to make our leaders smarter and the employees that help our clients and customers smarter. And so, you know, Sandy Pentland at MIT talks about this concepts of extended intelligence. And the comment is, you don't need smarter computers, you need smarter people using computers, right? And so we're really focused on using AI in a way, um, you know, that really helps our leaders make better decisions, helps our bankers make better decisions, and helps our call center reps handle our customers better. Um, and that often involves NLP and real life uh, transcriptions to actually kind of present information in a way that's faster, more efficient for our reps and so forth. And so that's another focus of ours. Um, you know, and then we have some just really big ideas that we're really moving forward on. And so at any given moment, we will, you know, we might, you know, five or six big ideas that we think are transformational. We'll spend a couple of years incubating them, thinking about them. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you get a patent application out of it, sometimes it doesn't work out, but that's all good. It's all part of the learning process. And so really executing against those really big transformative ideas is also part of our agenda. So those are three areas that we're really focused on right now. Very cool. I mean, it's great that you guys create that culture of innovation. I'm always encouraging uh, organizations that they need to create that incubator to fit, to, to try new ideas, to fail fast. Um, and you're one of the first uh, chief data and analytics officers we've had on the Disruptive Innovators podcast. And, you know, I think it it begs the question, what what is it like to work in data and analytics for a for a bank like Chase? Yeah, I think there's um there's a couple of reasons why I love this place and love this space. And so, you know, one, it is the golden era of data and analytics. And so if you kind of go back to the start of my career, you know, the chief data analytics officer job didn't really exist. Um, it right. was in certain forms in certain places, but it was really cap one that kind of codified the CDO role. And so, you know, that's been kind of an evolution, but now we have this incredible set of data assets. We have this incredible awareness of what that can do and the good it can do, quite frankly. And now we finally have the compute in a place with all the analytic techniques. And so everything has come together. And so you have this amazing moment and you know, as we talk about these big ideas, we always talk about like, this is the moment to do big things. And why would we not give it a shot, even if it doesn't work, at least we've tried and learned something. And so, you know, it's a really cool moment to kind of be doing this job at this moment. 
also, you know, at this firm and in financial services in general, you know, we believe we have kind of a, a bigger mission to help people. And, you know, finances are really private and they're personal. And if you were to go to our branches and hear the conversations of our customers and clients, they have real needs. And whenever interest rates go up or down or unemployment goes up or down, that is an impact on the households we serve, all 66 million of them. And so, you know, being able to use our tools and our capabilities to help customers manage their lives better, manage their finances better, is really an important thing that we believe in. And so when you put kind of that mission together with the capabilities that now exist, um, it's a pretty amazing moment to be in the space. Yeah, I would say, I mean, our when we realigned our mission, you know, uh, 12 months ago, we had a heavy emphasis on on healthcare and, and financial services for that reason, because like you're saying, you're able to impact the lives of the communities that you serve very, very in a very real way. Yeah, and David, one thing um, I was excited to, to do this was because of your focus on healthcare, um, you know, I think that the intersection between our space and that space um, is, is really incredible. And, you know, uh, the types of data, the techniques, the outcomes that you're, you're measuring, one is health, one is financial, but, um, you know, I love that, that mix. Uh, I think it's really important, so. Yeah, 100%. How about any, um, any uh, you know, I've, I've heard some myths about uh, working in, in data and analytics. Maybe, you know, I'm going to be stuck behind a, you know, a desk. I'm in a cellar somewhere. Any, any myths about data and analytics that you'd like to debunk while I have you here? Sure. I think there's, there's this view that we literally just sit and code and look up every so often and walk around and then get back and code and um, you know, that isn't the, the job so much. And so I think a couple of myths out there, you know, um, one is that quite frankly, you have to be a rocket scientist or a PhD in mathematics or analytics to actually work in the space. And, you know, there are a ton of jobs that we have within Chase and I would say most large organizations. And so, yes, we do have our data scientists and they're very hardcore, but those data scientists actually come from multiple disciplines. And so, we have people that are mathematically inclined. We have physicists, we have engineers. They come from all different types of places. And so that's kind of like one job family, but we also have business solutions leaders and they're really focused on partnering with our businesses, sitting down with our stakeholders and really crafting analytic solutions to problems. And so that doesn't require you to be a coder. That doesn't require you to actually have a PhD or a master's, it just require you to have an analytic mind and to think in that way and to try to solve problems in that way. But the real importance to us is you can do that and have a conversation with the business and craft a solution and execute. And so it's a pretty wide set of, of skills that we have within this organization. And so I think that's that's one thing. You know, the second thing is, you know, we spend a lot of our time thinking about the problem and thinking about the why and thinking about the customer and then you code. And when you start in the reverse, that never works out well. Those models are never as robust. Those algorithms never hold up as well. And so really having the right order of operations is really important for a career in this space. It's, it's cool to see too that, um, I mean, in, in your executive role, chief data and analytics officer versus just chief data officer, right? Because I've seen that too. I mean, do you think that plays a role in kind of creating this uh, um, you know, exciting environment at Chase? I think it does. And I think, look, it's been a well-studied conversation about, is it a chief data officer? Is it a chief analytics officer? Is it both? And various companies kind of went in different directions. And, you know, I would say that, you know, that organization and that firm, that company needs to understand where they are and where they need to go and what model works best from them. There are some places where that works really well, and that's fantastic. There's some places that probably want to evolve, but just need a little more time. I would say our model here has been in place for the past almost four and a half years. And so we do firmly believe that the D plus the A drives better outcomes and does it more efficiently. And, you know, we've tried it both ways ourselves. And so we've kind of landed at this model. Um, but we do believe in this concept of a factory. And basically, we call it a factory because when you think about large scalable problems, you think about the massive data that we have on 66 million households, you think about all those branch visits, all those phone calls, it's a tremendous set of data that we have, um, but to actually use and operationalize it in analytics, it does require factory, it requires an entire team. And 
in a factory, anyone can stop the line because anyone is as important to the outcome as anyone else. And so it's not just the data scientist, it's the person who moves the data, it's the person who makes sure that it's being used for the right purposes, it's the person who guarantees the privacy. And so we like this factory concept. We think that D plus the A helps us move with more speed and agility, um, but it may not be for everyone, but that is kind of where we're going with that. Very cool. And like you said, it opens up opportunities for more than just your classic data scientists. I like that. Um, so what are some of the biggest challenges facing you and your team now? We're post COVID, you know, what, what are some of the biggest uh, challenges facing uh, your organization? Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a couple of, of spaces and interestingly um, it's not so much on the analytic side. We kind of understand that and have really bright people who kind of work through those problems, you know, but, but within the space of financial services, the, the big debate that still goes on is, is it a branch or digital? Is it a human or digital? And so for your listeners, you know, we think the, the answer is quite simple. We're going to be where our customers are. And if they want us to meet them in a digital channel, we will absolutely be there and have those capabilities. But if they want to meet at a branch or on the phone, we'll be there as well. And so we do spend a lot of time ensuring that we have the right visibility into our customers, into their migrating patterns into their preferences and ensuring that we can be there at every step of the way. You know, and look, we operate a very large branch network, 5,000 locations across the entire country. And we use a ton of analytics to ensure that those branches are in the right places and are doing the right things for us. And I think at the end of the day, when we had COVID, our branches obviously gravitated more towards our digital channels. And that was great. And a lot of that has stuck quite frankly um, but at the same time, our bankers, our advisors were meeting with customers on Zoom or on the phone at high levels. And so it wasn't an or for our customers, it was an and. And so you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, 36 million customers walk into a branch every single year. Those are real humans who know how to use a phone and an app. But for this circumstance or for that reason, they're comfortable doing that. And we look at the customers that drive the majority of our balances they mostly will come in the branch as well. And so I think having that, that view is important. And as our customers shift, we will shift with them. But that certainly is one debate that we have and we kind of look at, you know, pretty, pretty broadly. Um, you know, the other thing is just the, the pace of those changes and understanding where customers are going. And so we are really focused on building the best, the best digital products we possibly can. And so, you know, we've kind of like created this product structure like so many other organizations have but we're committed to making sure that those product owners have all the data and analytics they need to actually create the right features, to create the right journeys, to orchestrate them in the right ways, and to create beautiful products that are designed well and meet the needs of our customers. And so, you know, we have a philosophy here within our product structure um, that, that it is a product owner, it is a tech owner, it is a design owner, it's a data owner. And that quad, if you really makes up our organizations when it comes to product. And so, you know, we're really focused on doing that as well. So there are some of the challenges, obviously, when you have to kind of orchestrate across channels, you have to make sure they're all synced up. You have to make sure that the products are synced up as well. And so that does present some unique challenges to us. But, you know, we do firmly believe in that model. Very cool. Um, what are some of the most uh, innovative technologies that, you think are going to support the future of Chase, the, the business vision that you described before? Yeah, well, we, we invest heavily in technology and we've obviously had a number of conversations with it publicly, but, you know, we spent about $12 billion, $12 billion across JP Morgan Chase globally on technology. And so it is a, a very large number. Um, it's a number that we believe is absolutely necessary to keep pace. And obviously, you know, the Chase portion of that is about $4 billion. And so, it is quite a large investment that we've made in technology. And we firmly believe that technology kind of underpins everything we're trying to do, not only when it comes to products, but also experiences and, and really ensuring that we keep pace with our customers. And so, you know, in terms of technology, we are all in on it. In terms of data analytics, we're really focused on two main things from that perspective. One is valorizing our data. And so we understand that to kind of compete in the future and to move at scale, it does require the data to be modernized, meaning you have clear understanding of what it is and where it is, 
It's moving through modern pipelines at speed. It streams appropriately when it needs to stream. You have all the events, you have all the marketplaces, the vocabularies and so forth. And so that is a major effort for us to modernize our data so that it can move with us where we need it to move. And then secondly, it is the public cloud. And so that is a destination for us. And we have a multi-cloud strategy. And so we are moving all of our on-prem environments up there analytically. And so that's another piece of work that we believe will power us in the future. Very cool. Um, all right, well, we're getting um, to some of our final questions here. Um, at kind of another philosophical uh, question, where do you see the banking industry going in the future? Or where do you think will be some of the biggest changes as time passes? Yeah, uh, if I knew the answer to that, I would be really well positioned. Um, I, I would say, you know, a couple of things. One, you know, obviously there has been a ton of interest from big tech in our space, as well as retailers in this space, as well as fintech players in the space. And, and we think that's very healthy for consumers. And so we understand that. Um, what we wanna make sure we do is actually stress to consumers the features we have created and the way we stack up. And so at the end of the day, you know, certain competitors have, have, have really zeroed in on certain populations and everything else, you know, that has helped us sharpen what we have to do and produce, what our customers want, what they need, what their expectations are. And so we keep a pretty wide lens when it comes to the future. And, and who's gonna be in it and what they're expecting and really keeping close to the customers. And so, you know, I think the debate about branches versus digital and so forth, that will continue. Right. I think it's gonna be a world that looks, you know, perhaps marginally different than what it does today in terms of the percentages, but I still think that customers at the moment want a branch presence and want a person to talk to, particularly when it comes to very personal financial needs. And so I think we'll continue to support that, but, you know, that's kind of, you know, one thing you know, and then secondarily, it really is all about staying close to the customer, personalizing at scale. I know those terms get thrown around frequently. Um, you know, we have a vision of what that looks like for our customers. We're moving towards it analytically. We mobilize the business around those. And so you know, that is a big focus for us. But I think if you can't actually personalize, you're not going to have much of a future, quite frankly. You just become a commodity. And so I think those things are really important going forward. I say it all the time, hyper-personalized and radically convenient. Um, and it's exactly. tricky when you need to remain PCI and or HIPAA compliant, but um, you know, exactly. it's great to see that Ch Chase is, is truly leading the charge. It's uh, really impressive to watch. Um, so um, Mark, I, I really appreciate having you on. If uh, we'd like to close with a question, um, if you could go back five or 10 years in time, what advice would you give your younger self? <laughs> so, um, you know, there'd probably be a few things, you know, one, you know, I spent uh, the first 27 years of my life kind of in the closet. And so I'd probably go back and tell myself to just stop and take a breath and everything will be okay. Um, and, uh, you know, just relax a bit. And so that's probably thing one. I think that's pretty, pretty common. Um, I also grew up in Arizona far, far away from New York City and all the businesses and companies that populate it. And so I might tell myself also to kind of think bigger and dream bigger earlier um, as opposed to kind of like later in life. And so um, those are probably the two things I tell myself. Well, Hal, it's, it's amazing to see that your journey led you to the position that you're in now. Really impressive. And Mark, I really appreciate having you on this afternoon. Absolutely. Thanks, David. Great to be here. Yeah. Thanks everybody for listening and uh, we'll tune in next week.